Christmas first, guys. What is really possible with the Final Fantasy remake? It's possible anymore. Right. Think about it, man. They blew our nips off. I'm feeling crazy. We come in, <laughs> coming in from dream space. I ain't even getting out of bed for this one. But the story of FF7 has changed. Whether people like it or not, did the blanket just change colour? Who knows? It's dream space. And this is what Final Fantasy VII Remake realistically is. It's now this amorphous puddle of possibilities. I mean, am I the only one who saw what happened? Sephiroth's back from the future? Parallel timeline Zack? Maybe not, maybe not. I've done a whole theory video on why it, it, it might not, but... This is some wild and precedent stuff, and... I think about it, if it is timelines, I mean timelines, I, I quite like timelines, obviously they can be done poopy, very easily poopy in many many ways, but it can be really cool, and I've done I've done more vids, I'm just going to be plugging all my vids, and I'm just going to dream space now man, what's the point, what's the point in editing out long theory vids, because I, I'm doing one theory vid on one thing, and then I, the next theory vid I'll do will contradict it because I don't actually know where any of this is really going. Like Square have flown my noodle. I thought I knew kind of the borders that Square Enix would or wouldn't cross with this story-wise. They crossed it. But what I want to propose, what I want to propose in dream space, what if it's actually nothing to do with timelines and future Sephiroth, I, I know it seems it, like he has the memories from it, but there's so much in this version of the remake that seems so out of place, so idealistic. I mean, I'm just gonna submit. What if this is all happening in Cloud's dream space? Now, what I mean by that, like, he's cast adrift in the live stream. When I did that last video about the false and true narrative, what I thought, man, is that's kind of how OG FF7 really plays the first part is from clouds pov his unreliable narrator and then as we go through the discs like each disc is more clarity in clouds brain so uh, that was the structure of ogf 7 now if square enix are doing this remake and they're like hmm we need to represent that same thing but across a episodic format, multiple episodes. What if each full game installment, you know, have however many that be, part two, part three, part four. I don't know, man. But what if the reason they introduced the, the plot ghosts, controlling the narrative of the story with Destiny, you know, and, and now Sephiroth has that. So, so like episode one was like the, the planet controlling the narrative and, and obviously Cloud at his most unaware state in the game like there's this whole blanket of illusion in part one that is this first game's level of deception in the storytelling that we experience in og now what if the next part two is slightly more clearer destiny is now broken but obviously what are we going to have to face in part two sephiroth now has the power to control destiny. So part two is going to be move away from like the planet in Shinra to Sephiroth crafting the narrative that what lies ahead does not yet exist. Cloud and the gang are gonna to have to navigate as Aerith warned, the real threat, we can beat him. Like Aerith said it at the bridge, we're going up against Seth straight away. Damn, I need a drink. My mouth is my mouth is dry in dream space. <laughs> now, let's just take a break for a sec here in dream space. I'm gonna have some dank music playing. We'll listen to that for a bit. All right, Tash. I'm in dream space. We're in dream space. Anything's possible, Tash. All of part one of the remake is a dream. Not really. When I say when I say dream, I don't mean dream. Even though there's some really cool reference to it, like Sephiroth's dream, the sweetest of dreams. I whispered it into Cloud's ear. I totally forgot to mention it, but FF7 remake theme song, the hollow theme song. Cloud asks, is it all a dream? Will I ever know? He asked that question for the theme song of part one. AKA, was this whole first section essentially a dream that 
Cloud will never be fully aware whether it was or not. Just think about it, why is that line in the song? Is that Square Enix posing the question to us? Dream space. Let's just chill out and listen to some of these deck tunes for a bit as we mull over what we so far covered in Dream Space. Breathing in. Let our minds expand for what we're going to cover. I don't know if the end of this will actually happen, but I think it's cool. I think it's just a cool idea that we sort of ascend levels of clarity, uh, the purple and the yellow flowers, covered in the last bit. Check it out and then come back to Dream Space. This is kind of a bounce off of that. And uh, man, the reception was good. You guys have been leaving comments. Dream Space is collapsing. <laughs> um, and a lot of people are having the same thoughts. Of course, there's some people who are like, Jesus, Pez, what kind of crack are you smoking it's the Nomura crack it's the Nomura crack okay you can't predict it until we start seeing some more content I hope we get it too I'm juicy I'm I'm thirsty for part two Jesse thirsty come over my house later and I'll reward you but let's just say that that is what part two will now be sort of Sephiroth's behind the scenes manipulative because it, it across sort of the June on I mean there is the boat crossing and whatnot we don't like really see Sephiroth that much in OG. So it'd be cool if like Sephiroth is like still away. No, we're still going to like Costa del Sol, going to Barrett's story. Like, we're, like what's Sephiroth gonna be doing? No, he's chilling up here with the powers to control destiny. What's he gonna be doing while we're off to Cosmo Canyon and Mount Coral and whatnot? Like I, I could see Sephiroth like altering things in the story like weaving different events for whatever he wants to to guide it to the actual path he wants here. Maybe kind of like that would be the theme of part two, like Sephiroth's illusion. He's sort of the puppet master behind the strings. I mean, he has been for part one, but to, to like a different degree of like manipulation, because now it's not the planet controlling with destiny. Now it's it's Sephiroth's design. And well, part three could be like, I don't know, like Genova's dream weaving of it or some other great grand sort of scheme i don't know something with minerva something with minerva i think yes i see the theme in dream space for Aerith being that yes yeah, she has to teach both cloud and the planet and also defeat sephiroth so i feel like Aerith knows this is the path they have to navigate through what is essentially storytelling narratives and what that means is this part one we've just experienced could be the greatest level of deception where it was essentially a dream that's why there's all those references that's why and i submit i submit these three things into evidence man evidence into dream space here we go number one set forth at the bridge it's huge it's huge no one could see seth and then Tifa touched Cloud and everyone could see him and he became tangible. The Ultimate Mania even pointed the significance of that moment out. Ooh, that was the moment that Sephiroth went from being someone only Cloud could see to now all of them. Then I submit Aerith's house, the, the date scene. Cloud asks, is it a dream? This like space where it feels really real and like they're there. And he asks how it's possible. And Aerith says, maybe you tell me. Cloud Dream Weaver, he could be. What if Cloud is making those spaces? What if the infinite potential Chirdley spoke about is that Cloud can do that? And anyway, I covered that in the last video. I think when I couple that with all the like kind of idealistic aspects in this version that seems sort of amped up, like Jesse's so much thirstier for Cloud. Yeah, we put that into dream space. The thirst, submitting as evidence. Like the weird moments that happen where like Cloud just looks at like cats and then they become like a real thing that keep emerging when he gets lost in thought. Like even when Ghost snatches his mind, he looks like a cat. Uh, there's all these small kind of like things like flitting behind the scene. Like those moments are just sad and like why he and the gang's power level, they seem slightly more amped. And like at the end, like suddenly they're in space at the edge of creation. And, and, so for, and you know, Cloud is throwing down the final battle. Like... Who remembers the final battle? Well, Cloud does. We, we saw it with the planet. And when we're destroying the Harbinger at the end, like Cloud gets that moment of him standing off against Sephiroth. So is it because the planet gave Cloud that power in his mind that that scene then played out? The idea that Cloud can do this, is it really that wild? When Sephiroth's very existence 
is based on Cloud's memory. I will never be just a memory. That's literally how he exists indefinitely on the planet. He's staring us in the face. He's staring us, man. Deep. I need to chill, man. I'm going to chill to some tunes for a bit. I'm going to enjoy this. All right, let's get back to dream space. So uh, this comment, I want to read it from Steve. Thanks, Steve. <laughs> uh, that name makes me laugh. I'm playing Catherine, it's such a weird game. Steve, Steve died. He was a fellow interdimensional sheep person who's, uh, I was cheating with his girlfriend. Um, but yeah, they said, there's a theory that I keep seeing around where the game is taking place in Cloud's head while he's adrift in the live stream. Me too, man. I've seen some really compelling, like this is just one version what I'm auditing here of what I have seen lots of other people kind of getting the impression of like things in in part one they seem like pretty faithful to the original story but there's just so many moments of deviation that are so striking and bizarre that what if this comment Steve has left uh, I, I like it there's a theory that I keep saying it works pretty well with your observation it's not the best storytelling but makes a lot more sense and is less uh, lazy writing than time travel. <laughs> Multiple dimensions, ideas uh, out there. Yeah, I mean, I ain't gonna deny it. It's, it. For me, I don't mind what device is being used. It's just always how it's used it and how you build the characters and the story and what the, the, the payoffs are. And you know, for every person that's gonna feel different, man. Like for some people, even the smallest deviation is enough for them to be like, no, nah, this is what I wanted. Uh, we all gonna be tested, man, on how far and how faithful we are in our minds to the original story. That is what Cloud and the planet are literally doing, especially the planet, especially what, what are the ghosts there to do? Trying to keep things as faithful to the original. <laughs> So that's, in a plot kind of way, that's Squared almost kind of telling us that as these layers and, and with all this other evidence like, and ideas out there, um, this one being that Seth and Aerith are both in the live stream at this point. Sephiroth trying to corrupt the narrative and Cloud's mind while Aerith is functioning as the therapist is surprisingly logical in this scenario. Certainly explains all of their knowledge of the future weird behavior, could also explain Cloud controlling rally. So something where this first part is actually taking pet place while clouds in that live stream place when i actually look at it, i think something like that actually kind of fits the theme of ff7 much nicer what what with the, like the nature of the live stream and genova's hallucinogenics which are pretty wild i mean we saw in the genova fight like the crew were teleported like this whole other real looking tangible place like Genova's hallucinations are they're, they're vivid they're they're way more vivid even in part one of the remake than it was even OG so why could that be well I think Genova is more potent what what was the telltale sign the 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 black goo that fell off Genova I mean it may have been there in OG and they just couldn't like actually show it but that was really from Advent Children. That was the Geo Stigma. Now, if we have a theory that Sephiroth has come back from post Advent Children, well, Sephiroth and Genova are inherently linked, mother and son, then is it that out there to think that Genova is also empowered by this return of Sephiroth? And that's why the Geo Stigma's there. I know, spitballing ideas. You spitballing ideas in dream space. And to be honest, oh my God, I'm just thinking about this now. Think about it, the first ghosts that ever harassed Aerith at the start of the game, none of them were purple. Purple being the story narrative corruption. What if that's why the purple, the ghost started turning purple? Aerith touched Cloud and then Cloud went out and touched other people. <laughs> oh, that sounds weird, but that's kind of what the game showed to us, especially with Rufus seeing the ghost only after he fought Cloud. What if that's how Sephiroth infiltrated Destiny? He did it through Cloud. Because it was then, later on, significantly the next day, when Jesse gets pushed down the stairs, that Sunny Wonder Ghosts are now corrupted. 
Well, was it Cloud that did the corrupting when Jessie thirsted on Cloud, when she touched him? Oh, my God. Jessie's thirst literally corrupted destiny. Oh, oh my God. Jessie Raspberry's libido is potentially what just destroyed the world. Well, not destroyed the world, but allowed Sephiroth to get in this. <laughs> That's pretty wild, man. And what if the way that they did it got Cloud to infiltrate for them was because Sephiroth and Genova are more powerful, again, piece of evidence before, and in turn, so is Cloud. What if all the Genova clones are slightly more powerful now? Think about it. this guy are sick in OG he wasn't actually in like a black robed hood yet. He was just a guy sat there ill, but like he was like pretty comatose. Now he's like an ill guy in a robe up and walking around and able to transmit through Sephiroth. Like all the clones like do way more in part one. They're like much better now. I like transporting Sephiroth around allowing him to appear to be way more manipulative. Is that because all of the negativity that Sephiroth has been carefully laying in the live stream, which is covered in the live stream chapters, he's been doing all that work and now he's harvesting all of that power, which is empowering all the clones, which is also empowering Cloud, which is giving Cloud's Genova cells a far more potent hallucinogen, hallucinogenic effect, which is why these weird dream spaces are happening. Why Sephiroth is encouraging Cloud to have dreams? Because through Cloud, Sephiroth was both infiltrating and crafting the first layer of his deception, which worked. It got him to break destiny. But what I don't think he's anticipated is Aerith actually going along with it. And she worked out the plot of these ghosts. <laughs> of these, the plot of these plot ghosts. She figured them out. And she was preparing the planet to have this happen. That's why there was all that therapizing I spoke about in the last video. That's why she was asking permission and sending these hints about the yellow flowers to tell the planet, to tell the planet to drop the false narrative, to prepare it for that to happen. That's why like, the, the flower dissolved. And I even think there's something really cool that uh, someone mentioned in the video, like what, what if the yellow flowers follow them? The yellow flowers is not just Aerith guiding the planet through this transition, from its own controls to Sephiroth. And obviously that means that the power, uh, the planet is now disempowered. It's fundamentally had its final weapon, its last resort taken away from it. I, th I think the game even says that like, this thing's a last resort, the Harbinger. So the planet is going to be really vulnerable. And what if she was also tagging the people? Because think about it, the, the, the planet, if you spoke to it, it wouldn't speak like a, a human conversation, would it? I think it would be more symbolic, uh, symbolic through nature. Of course, that's what the Cetra were. They were very symbolic through nature. That's how they express, that's how they crafted their magic. I don't think Aerith would say, oh, help these humans. They're the ones who are gonna be on your side. She wouldn't say that. What if she was tagging people with the yellow flowers? Consciously tagging them. That's why she put on Cloud's lapel. That's why it symbolizes reunion. Then Aerith asked in really prying detail, remember that this scene. She was really prying who Cloud had given the flower to. Was that her checking that Tifa had been tagged? And then think about it, Marlene, when her and Aerith have their transference, what's the first thing Marlene does? She goes up to the yellow flower. We then see her watering it at the end. Marlene's been tagged. This is a message from Aerith to the planet to say, these are the ones who are going to be your allies in this next stage. Now, whether the planet will actually respond to that, listen to that, whether Minerva will listen to any of that bullshit, I don't think she will. I, I want her to be in the story. Genesis Legacy is there. I don't know. There's so much, there's so much richness that could come in, but all of this in like a really subtle way, because this is the thing, this all sounds pretty like dramatic and crazy, doesn't it? It's like, oh, Pez, I don't want it to be like a dream space, that's lame. But that's the thing, it, it doesn't have to be framed in such obvious boxes. When I'm saying it in a theory, it sounds like it, but it's not obvious. And what I think would be so cool is that the remake no, it doesn't get too lost in all of these ideas, but that those ideas are present just on a fundamental, wow, this is how they structured it. These were the levels of deception that we passed through in OG FF7, and it, no, it felt quite 
significant between chapters the kind of manipulation that's going on the kind of breakdowns that Cloud's having as he gets closer to the truth shit gets like even crazy and he has more breakdowns and you know it, even OG it gets wild think about it man think about it not only does Tifa get caught out on her line not only does um Red 13 get tricked into handing over the materia like Sephiroth even turns himself into Tifa like like shit pops off and at times the group almost turn against each other and Cloud hands off the materia now how are they going to justify cloud handing off the materia twice twice in this super triple a realistic game do you think it's going to feel realistic in storytelling where you know we go on this whole mission through like oh shit dreams of base is collapsing we go <laughs> we go all through this like temple of the ancients to get this materia just for then like a 10 second cutscene to happen where cloud hands it off Kind of how it happens in OG. That would feel lame. That's that's not the kind of storytelling level that they've clearly decided to turn this into an episodic format because they really want to expand out these points, these topics. Like that's literally what they said. They wanted to do FF7 remake um, as if FF7 were being made today. And actually, you know what this all kind of is like. Someone left a comment. I agree. It, it's actually kind of what they should have done with 15. It, it's like Nomura is actually kind of showing more of what his idea for Versus was in the 7 remake. Follow me here. What we just recently learned about that was that in FF15 when Noctis was in the crystal for 10 years, he was supposed to dream in dream space the events of the Versus 13 trailer, like Noctis holding the Citadel, the Dark King, all of that amazing shot. We were supposed to play that. Apparently that was going to be an idea for 15. So that was essentially what the crystal was going to be and they even showed a trailer of it like there was a trailer where Regis peered into the crystal and there was like an alternate narrative in that particular trailer it was not just rejecting the loss of Luna in a really bad way and in turn tripping out but th that's essentially what we're going to do we're going to dream these different realities and that was what was then going to you know, teach Noctus um, and, and make him the king that he was but we, we didn't see that we didn't see that in 10 years like he just had a, a snooze and came out a <laughs> a king like a really mature king dude oh man they missed a trick with that but could Nomura now be wanting to recycle that and, and tie in a way that it does it works in the context of FF7 and that again the levels this levels FF7 story is an onion you peel it and the closer you get to the middle it's like fuck my eyes are bleeding <laughs> who's cutting the onions the onions Who's cutting them? Fuck. Like, I'm pretty sure. I, I, I don't know the origins of who's cutting the onions. I know, think about it, it's probably like some peasants in like the 1200s. It's probably always thing, been a thing. Everyone's eyes are always running from onions, but I don't know. Did FF7 start it? Probably. Who's cutting the onions? Like, what if Nomura has even seen that that's a big Western meme and he's like, we've got to make this game like an onion. <laughs> Anything is possible. So what if the white material fundamentally gets played in this as what, you know, because Aerith uses the white hand, the magic, magic hand transference, and, you know, she does it at the portal or at the Destiny's crossroads. What if she was using the white material to essentially ascend herself to the next level of essentially reality? Uh, because think about what the white, white material is. You know, it is, the, the live stream is the souls of the planet. Holy is what the planet can reset the story with. Bugen Hagen told us. He said essentially when holy is used and it goes green uh, with someone's prayer, it essentially allows the planet to start again with whatever it deems good for the planet. And so there's the whole debate on whether it was humans or not. And Bugen Hagen said he wasn't sure which he would choose. Well, what if, you know, Advent Children and all of that? No, is canonical and you know Kadaj Laws and Yuzu being the remnants kind of makes it seem it is what if yeah Genova and, and Sephiroth they harvest all their hatred juices they infiltrate Cloud at that past moment and that the way the planet counters that is to essentially send Aerith into the story because the, the white material can access the pool of memory remember every memory in the planet is recorded Aerith more or less told us this with this, this line here. All these moments and memories, precious and fleeting, they're like rain rolling off his back. 
Yeah, man. All those memories are like rain rolling off a duck's back. Or oh, whatever she said, that's close enough. Like she's essentially talking about his disregard for the, the, the sanctity of memory that, that is so sacred to the planet that it is preserved. It is the, the fundamental flow. That's what's explained in OGF7. That's how the planet grows and evolves. That like memory go, returns to the planet and it nurtures it. That is the essence of the life of the planet, memory itself. And now that Sephiroth has, again, used the amplified Genova qualities of Cloud to infiltrate back in the story, the White Materia has sent Aerith into the story. And that's why everything feels so amplified in this remake. Like, not just Jesse's thirst, though it's real. Like, everything, like wedges, pudgy cuddliness. Like, he's, he's so loving to, like, cats and people. And Barrett starts to, like, trust and respect Cloud sooner. Tifa, literally, you know, she, she, she's so much more involved in this. Um, Nomura actually recently said, when she saved Cloud, you know what she runs, she grabs his hand after the Rufus fight. Sort of, you know, says he's, he's got to be better if he wants to be the hero. He actually said that was a response, or it might have been Katase, to uh, since chapter five at the bridge, you know, when Cloud falls. They said that that was a response to that. So it's like uh, Tifa's learning her, her, her lesson quicker. You know, in OG, she just leaves Cloud at the shouldn't building. This time she comes back. I mean, I'd even say Reeve. Like, Reeve is more compassionate this time. Like, he, he does. He cares more. He speaks more out against Shinra. That's why Kate Sith showing at the, up at the plate means something. Because that means Reeve actively tried to stop it this time. Whereas in OG, Reeve was kind of like a, a negligent but caring bystander. He watched the atrocities happen and he kind of felt penned in. Like, he couldn't stand against them. That, that's why he had Kate Sith hand over the keystone. But now he seems way more resistant. Is it because, yeah, if this is all playing again, and the way that Sephiroth got back was through Cloud, and, and the way that Aerith got in was through the white material. So Aerith is essentially in the back in the story. She's, she's like inserted in into the memory of that timeline that, that exists within the live stream. That's why no, she, she, she knows so much. That's why there's the 50 different places on that Reddit post where Aerith put her mouth in it and revealed that she basically knew. And that, you know, Tifa keeps asking Aerith, what, you're not telling me? It makes so much more sense that Aerith is essentially walking in a, a non-reality. I mean, it is a reality because it is the real memory of the planet. Again, it's stored. It's just replaying. But that makes so much sense why, like, Sephiroth could just touch Aerith's hand at the start and freeze her. What? None of us really questioned obvious things happening in the game because we didn't think Square would, would go this far. But no, the things like we saw the key art of like Sephiroth's wing. Well, if he's got the wing, it means he's post-Advent children. We didn't even think to think of that. Well, when we see Sephiroth just actively freeze Aerith in place, is that essentially him, yeah, being one of the two who are infiltrated in on this replaying story and he pauses her, like, pauses her go in the story just for a moment so that he can, you know, weave some manipulation in and then it continues like that's the clearest hint that Aerith and Sephiroth are kind of outside this story they're above it and that they're they're battling for who controls the narrative well, I'm convinced man we've been sitting here debating and like getting brain blown over what all these different things mean in this first part I bet Square Enix are just laughing I bet they're just laughing. I bet they're like, they, they don't even realise that this whole first section and all the weird stuff is just because this is a layer of like semi-dream reality that is being amped up by the supercharged Genova cells in Clown's body because by Sephiroth harvesting the negativity he sowed in Advent Children, it empowered him and Genova, but as a byproduct, also Cloud, and that's why he's why he's powerful that's why again I'm, I'm gonna repeat the same moment cloud gets shown a flash of his showdown with sephiroth and then barely a scene or two later it's actually happening on the moon or, or actually i like the idea of on the back of the arriving meteor Woof, that would be, oh, that'd be a great story. And what I could really see is all the things that we've been worrying about and, and, and debating about and, and considering where the story's going, I could see it just all becoming irrelevant by part two. Just everything we thought we knew where it's going, just, just trickle away because fundamentally a different type of narrative and who's writing it will be happening as both Sephiroth and Aerith have progressed. You know, these outside players in the story 
Aerith put her sparkly spark. No, so Sephiroth cut his way through to the next story. You know, and when he, he slashed and he went through. What we could describe as like, like a cut through memory, like the fundamental fabric of reality through a layer of memory itself. Jesus. Something that Aerith would see as, of course, a very grievous thing. And, and over that scar he cut, she used holy magic that she became affinitied with also because of the events of OG. In other words, Sephiroth's benefiting from the OG story, but so too is Aerith. And that's that she became an active holy user and she uses it to cast the white over the scar, heal it and pass the team through as safely on to the next layer of story. <laughs> Tell me you don't like that. Tell me. I don't know. Maybe some people won't, but so elegant. <laughs> of course, when when Holy was actually summoned as the whole story, that apparently the flower girl's cry rang out to the whole planet. Every soul heard it and rallied to her cry for help. That was what allowed, gifted Aerith with the ability to stay individualized in the live stream. Like she didn't understand why she was able to keep her form. And she asked the question in mind, so what does the planet want for me? What? I've still got a role to play. And even though an OG, the idea's there. After live stream uh, and holy flashes, what do we see again? Aerith's face. Hello, I'm individualized in the live stream. I've got something left to do. <laughs> I'm coming back into the story. Sephiroth, I'm coming for you. <laughs> oh man, it's pretty much written in like, yeah, she, she, becomes, she becomes the power of holy. I think instead of like a timeline, story going on a fundamental memory one associated with the white material is what is allowing Aerith to ascend the levels of deception why she can actually use the power of holy right here right now why it's all happened before so i can only think that when Aerith's death scene comes like Sephiroth's gonna do something We're like what if he stops her preying upon holy what, what if he just stops her and, and so that means that in this version the power of holy doesn't get um, activated, which if this crazy dream space theory holds in, what means that Aerith, should Sephiroth come back into the story again, she would lose her access to it and Sephiroth would win. Which puts a, a huge f finality of importance that in this event of the timeline, that they succeed. And, and let's say like Holy can't come to stop me or in this version, it's just a live stream. Well, who, who would have to be there instead? What about like Cloud? Cloud freaking Dreamweaver. Like what if he has to be there in place of where Holy could not be? And is that why the VR segment showed that, that event happening? Yeah, it could have been a, a Genova spurred hall hallucination and definitely a hint that it could, but what if he was seeing some, something fundamentally real and that Cloud has to go into Midgar at the end rather than just observing from the airship like they did in OG. He actually has to go in and that's why there's that standoff with Sephiroth Cloud. That's why there's seven seconds for Cloud to make a decision. What will he do with it? I hope any of what I'm saying is making any kind of sense. I think it's cool. I think it's got a lot of really cool possibilities. Cloud's personal navigation from sort of the, the dream state that he even starts OG in, you know, to the full weight of clarity. And the thing is, it's not just an upward slope to clarity in the game. It's not, it's a bloody... This is what the whole FS7 is, and they could just make that roller coaster ride so much rockier, and, and the drops can be so much steeper. The adrenaline can be so much higher, and, and yeah, just the consequences can be so much more real. But there we go, guys. What do you think? I've got so much more I could waffle about, but I'm already running on time. This is. Let me know if you like dream space. This is such an easy, it's so easy. It's a spitball ideas down here. Uh, only the most faithful to a trippy plot in the middle of a crack will really enjoy this video. But let me know, guys, what do you think about all that? Until the next. Whatever this is. <laughs>